yeah, so the goal of this panel is to talk about tooling um, in the FB ecosystem for well, Ethereum and more, I guess, and to talk about how um, different organizations that build tools and use tools to do audits and other things utilize those tools and um, how to move forward from that. So first I'd like to ask each uh, panelist here to introduce themselves, their organization, and um, briefly talk about what kind of what kind of work they do in the organization and what projects they work with um, or that they have engagements with. Yeah, Gonzalo, please. Yeah, let's go. My name is Gonzalo. I'm one of the co-founders of the Consensus Diligence team. Um, we've been doing security for the past six years now. Uh, we've been building tools for security, more importantly, for this panel as well. So besides doing security audits uh, and having been born as a crypto native uh, security firm, we have also developed in-house a, a suite of tools uh, that were aggregated uh, for a while behind an API called Mithex. Uh, and it was a collection of static, analy uh, static analyzer, dynamic analyzer, and a fuzzer um, with engines built by us as well. Uh, that has since been phased out and will soon be open source. So I think this is the first time that I'm actually saying this. Our tools will be made open source in a matter of months, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, that happened, Mithex was phased out, um, tools will be open source. The fuzzer, though, uh, is, is still productized, so right now it's called Diligence Fuzzing, and it's basically the Harvey fuzzer uh, in a hosted manner, basically, so, so the tool will be open source, but uh, Diligence Fuzzing will still exist as, a, as an easier way to, to utilize the, the fuzzing engine. Yeah, that's it. Hi, I'm Modi Sagib. Uh, I'm probably one of, probably the oldest guy here. Uh, sorry? Not sure. Not sure. Okay. So basically my background is formal methods. I've been working on it for many, many years, but mainly academically, reasoning about small, tricky programs, like AVL trees that you have heard in the news. It's actually one of my first proof. But four years ago, together with uh, Shelley Grossman, we started Setora. Satora, Satora builds tools for formally verifying code and then actually has been used by fantastic customers like Maker to find bugs which were four years old. And basically the Satora tool uses SMT solver. At the moment we are developing several things. First we have an open source language called CVL which is basically for writing the properties. And then we have tools at the moment. One of them will be open source but most of them are proprietary. The first one is Satora Prover that you can try. It's actually been used by many others and mentioned in the previous talk. That the second one is a fuzzer which is coming. And the third one which will be open source which is developed by Chandra which is somewhere here but I can see her. It's called Gambit. It's a tool for checking specifications. So the idea is when you write specification, we have several customers that use our tool in addition to auditing but because they had a bug in the specification, the, the tool didn't find it. So we have now an open source tool for checking the CVM, it's based on mutation testing. The idea is that you try to mutate the program and if the verification still succeeds, something is wrong. And we are working with it and also we are collaborating with fantastic auditors and Code Arena to use this for checking the tools. Hello everyone, my name is Dima. I'm CEO and co-founder of company Haken. Uh, Haken is originally from Ukraine, now we have to live in Lisbon, uh, Portugal. Uh, we are active users of uh, your tools and a lot of other tools. And thank you so much for making our work easier. Uh, well, our main source of business is not only smart contract audits, we are uh, doing a lot of penetration tests for cryptocurrency exchanges. We work with maybe like 30 out of 50 exchanges in the space. We also do L1 audits. Uh, but if we are uh, here at the panel discussing tools, I can uh, tell about two products that we are building. It's uh, uh, the on-chain analytic, uh, on-chain monitoring tool that will be able to pause the smart contracts if something is happening and we see it on mempool. And the other thing is um, serve.life, CR.life is the um, security data aggregator where we gather all the security data and we analyze it compare the audits with actual code deployed and this is something that can be 
useful for every security engineer in space. Thank you. Yes. And uh, my name is Michael Llewellyn. I've been at Opens Up for about two years. Started managing audits on that team and then moved to uh, essentially focusing on solutions architecture, which in a nutshell I say is basically just me describing what all the Lego pieces that Open Zeppelin are and then prescribing Lego kits for certain clients, including Compound and many others. Um, the Lego pieces are, in very short order, uh, the contracts library, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, many of our audit services, which mainly focused on EVM and smart contract audits, um, and then also several tools we've been developing that are more focused on, I would say, post-deployment concerns. So. Defender is kind of a security operations platform that gives you the ability to do uh, monitoring, incident response, automate certain key procedures for your protocol, um, have a nice administration interface for doing upgrades, that sort of thing. Uh, and then we've also spun out a project for a decentralized monitoring protocol called Forda, which is kind of trying to build a more composable monitoring layer. Um, you know, for example, being able to build like MIT licensed scanning bots for like detecting either vulnerabilities or just doing event like, you know, watching, for example, bridges to see if they do anything suspicious, quickly alert teams, and then be able to react, and then integrate with our tools to do that reaction. Um, so, yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, yeah, those answers kind of, they, they lead pretty well to the next question. Um, so, you already mentioned that you have a few tools that you that you built in-house, right, for, for your own projects, and, but as David mentioned, you also use tools from Sertora and other people, right? So. Um, next question for everyone it doesn't have to be the same order. Of course, we can shuffle a little bit. Um, how much, uh, how often do you use tools from other organizations or just like open source tools that are there? Or like how, how often do you try out different tools um, to see how they work well in combination with maybe your tools or just a massive combination of all the tools out there? So what's, what's your experience in, um, yeah, with other tools? I can pick this one up. Uh, we don't, unfortunately, like, not unfortunately, I, I don't think this is, like, unfortunate, per se, but uh, we, we just don't. Like, so since we've we spent this much effort, like, building the tools in-house, that means uh, that when we are auditing, we consume our own things. And, and the reason for that is that it's easier for us to manage the code base. So if something is wrong, if something is not fine-tuned enough, then we can easily change the code base so that it, it serves our own needs. Um, we do, however, so for example, like we've talked to Sertora, and there's like a, 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 so even though we don't necessarily use other people's tools during our audits, there's a, there's a, a, a high degree of cooperation that we want to achieve. So we really want our tools to be compatible with, say, uh, the Sertora Prover Engine, right? So we want to, for example, one of the things that we've developed is Scribble, which is a partial, partial specification language, right? Um, that, that comes off as, as net spec comments on, on Solidity code. And it's a transpiler. Although, like, it could very well be, be translated to something that is very easily verifiable with their engine. And so even though we don't use them, we are very, very in tune with, with other companies and we really want to make cooperation happen. So follow up on that question. I agree with the point of like, it's for sure easier for for you to fix the code of your own tool, right? But don't you think that like in this space, it's I think it's very well understood that like no tool can do everything, right? So don't you think that it's worth it to kind of explore other tools for like small niches that your tool may not be that good at? Absolutely. Uh, one one thing that I think is preventing us from like actually getting to that point as well is education so it's way easier for us to have our product team teach our auditors how to use the product right whereas maybe if we have someone from uh, <laughs> by the way this this is an actual invitation if we have a session for someone with Sertor like actually going through the motions of like hey this is what you need to do this is what you need to do maybe it would be easier for us but as and this is dumb because this is this is literally our skewed incentives like brains working against us because like it's hard for us to justify that we put in the time to learn a new tool when in all essence our our deadlines are so short and like we're always running against the clock and so like it's hard for us to justify learning a new tool in order to use it ourselves you know I think that's a hundred percent the case and what is had basically like when Everett invited me to have a session with a few of the um, RV oh, um, so I had a session with a few RV people to basically show how to use a SMT checker and just like 
what type of options are good for um, different use cases, but of course it's a massive effort for for the engineers to learn and talk completely from. from I'd love you to do one of those for us. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, we can set it up. But I think it's complementary. You can we can exactly, use yeah. them. And for example, we at the moment we are limited to to basically to EVM, and soon actually EBPF is coming. But we are not supporting many other chains. And basically, what this is what we collaborate with RV. Also, I don't know if this is what you mean by our question, but we, the Sator approval is essentially a very, very sophisticated way to call SMT solvers. And we leverage, we call actually, I think the number of times that we call SMT is about 100,000 more than everybody called them in the fall. That's what they're telling us. And we consume a lot of open source software, not from, from basically from the academic com community, but we, and we also contribute. It's uh, for the three, for CVC5, it's uh, these tools without the C, without Z3 or CVC5, Sertora is useless. It's a, Sertora does a lot of things, but right. at the end of the day, it's called the SMT solver. You, you guys do PRs for the solvers? That's pretty cool. Yeah, we do oh, PR. Sure. Yeah, yeah. That's we awesome. Do. Yeah, yeah. We, we do a lot of stuff. I mean, actually, the, and we. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's giving <laughs> back. That's pretty cool. Yeah, but it's more like a vertical approach, right? Because Sertora depends on these solvers. Yeah, yeah. And what we were talking before is more like a horizontal thing. Yeah, yeah, horizontal. Well, these tools that kind of like do the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that's also good. Cool. Like yeah. uh, we we heard from every talk, like co co collaborating with with a uh, yeah foundry and with 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 your yeah. tool and using Scribble and yeah. And how about you, Timo? So you mentioned that you've, you've been working with tools like Sertora and others. So what's your experience? Uh, I thought about Mythics. Uh, uh, sorry, I thought about Mythics. And um, so, first of all, for us, it was important to develop a methodology, and um, to, so we are covering all the risks and all the potential vulnerabilities. And uh, according to our uh, research, and also I was reading uh, Trial of Peace research, uh, still there are not uh, no available tools that can cover all the high risks and uh, like tools uh, that we have right now um, if you take a big number of projects they can like pick up around 75 percent of the high risk so there is still another 25 percent that should be picked up manually so according to our methodology we always use mythics and uh, we use the Sittler uh, uh, Silter. and if we talk about uh, the uh, fuzzing test we use a hidden um, and Still, we are going one by one each line of code, and we are verifying not with the tools like, uh, unfortunately, runtime verification, uh, which are very good and automated, but uh, using our own uh, audit uh, management system. Uh, but yeah, we we emphasize our clients to do a proper documentation, and we make sure that we cover everything that they do. Yeah, yeah I mean, for our part, we. Uh, like I guess alluding to what uh, Gatel just was talking about, like auditors are very picky with tooling because if the tooling is not like very quickly set up and very quickly giving them helpful feedback, it's just wasting time. Um, so we've had, uh, I would say it opens up and we've been pretty focused on like just, if we have a choice between uh, helping an auditor get bet better at auditing versus investing in the tool, we typically go with the auditor, but we also still try to encourage tooling where it makes sense, but more from a, what can we run initially to like uh, get as much of this like, the easy, like low level, like or, or really simple bugs out of the way, and then like let the rest of the, the auditors essentially like go wild on the weird stuff. Um, and I think like what we've also been trying to encourage is like, well, we'll, we'll still use that tooling in our audits. Um, we're also really trying to encourage our customers to just do that themselves as much as possible, um, so that they essentially don't have to pay us to run a tool they might have been able to do themselves. Now some things are complicated. They're like, how do I interpret this, or how do I um, actually use the output the tooling has given me? Um, and that's where we can still be helpful and sometimes we have like kind of pre-audit assessments that will like dive deeper. So we've never really focused on developing that, that pre-deployment like uh, analysis checking. We've really focused more on the post-deployment side, which is monitoring. And that to us is a lot more valuable for our audits because we can then say, okay, we've understood your code. Now we can identify like, for example, the system assumptions, the things are like, okay, well, we're assuming that Oracle behaves, uh, but what happens if it doesn't? And this is something you can monitor for. Um, so, so that's just why we've like personally been going down more post-deployment than pre-deployment, but like that isn't to say the pre-deployment tooling isn't important, it's like massively important and it makes our jobs easier if the clients use them. Without wanting to jump the gun and maybe this is a question, but uh, I, I feel this is really, really true. Like if you're an auditor and you have a choice of tools at your disposal, 
you will like 99% of the time go with the stuff that has instant output and, and just clears the low hanging fruit. How, how do you feel about that? Like, how do you feel about utilization of the SMT checker, for example? Have you guys polled yeah. the community? Um, yeah, actually, this is a topic that I want to bring up next, but maybe you want to say something? Or, oh, uh, no, no, I just wanted to say that uh, when you are. When you see that there are some uh, issues that were not picked up, uh, you're thinking, okay, um, can we develop a tool that will pick this up? But then you are thinking from the business perspective, how much time will you spend on uh, building this tool? How much resources? And then you understand that uh, from business perspective, it doesn't make sense. So you rather like outline these checks that you have to manually do in your methodology and then uh, it, like, uh, it will not be so costly. Unfortunately, this is the truth. Yeah, um, Yeah. answer to your question, Marcel. I feel like also Avrik brought up this topic earlier. There's still a lot of education and kind of like this developer experience missing. There is a pretty big gap still, right? I feel like most of these tools, especially form verification tools, um, they are hard to use and they're hard to know how to use them well and they're hard to interpret the output, right? And um, and I feel like this, yeah, the instant output part is a bit of a paradox because these tools will probably never give you an instant, like a useful instant output, right? Only if the if the if the input is very simple. So it's it's it's, it's really hard to. So usually, and when when I'm using like my own tool to do to things, um, if I know something hard, then I usually just spawn multiple instances with a few different configurations. And then while the solver is running for let's say half an hour, an hour, two hours, then I do a manual check. So just a combination of both. But I feel like I can do it efficiently because I know how the tool works 100%. So I know how to in two minutes spawn multiple instances that are gonna run 24 hours of um, analysis in two hours and do a manual check and fuzzing and other things. Um, at the same time, but because I'm the person who writes, writes that tool. So if it's like a random developer, can they do the same thing? Like obviously not, but how can we get to the point where they can do something with it, right? So that, that's when you see efforts like whatever it was presenting from like making it easier for, and I feel like that tools started that, at least from the FB side, right? So what I said earlier, people were just like saying, uh, we were just like running, from verification tests and not really knowing what's happening in the background, but but it's still legit. Like it, they're still running small execution and get like a per, per, very big assurance on on their code just by naming a function prove instead of test, right? So and, and myself, I've also added found integration to my tool, and Everett did the same for um, for KVM. And um, how do you see that part of the integration of your own tools with? Um, with one, what you're trying to analyze. 100% on board. Actually, with, like Everett was just like, we, we were talking back at DeFi Security Summit like, about exactly that and like, yeah, we're totally on board. It just makes sense. Even from, and this is also the reason why we're open sourcing our tools. Because what we've, what we've realized so far is that like, there's a slight competitive edge in having a closed, uh, closed source code base. But, that gets totally diluted. And, and looking back, this probably was the wrong way to launch all, all our products because the, the competitive edge that is gained is probably diluted in the amount of people that don't use it. And so like uh, our path forward from here is exactly what, what you were talking about and what you guys did, like is as many integrations as possible, as much uh, you know, cooperation as possible and as much integration as possible with different tools that, from our own code base. Uh, sorry, Willie, uh, Dima was handing this phrase. Sorry. Um, um, so I think that's, uh, and this is the work we are uh, doing with Servlet Life. So we want to disaggregate the uh, information in the audit report to the test being done. And uh, I'm I'm pretty sure that the public should know if the product, uh, the smart contract, uh, was having a formal verification test or not. And you know, because our industry is so fast and there are so many plans, um, I, I guess everybody remember 
that 30k was starting as a formal verification too. Yeah. And right now they are not doing it. Like maybe they do, but <laughs> I, I think that it's not in their list of services anymore. Uh, but um, yeah, um, I, I'm sure that all the big protocols with huge liquidity, they have to have um, formal verification. And there should be a place where people can go and check, not just like a page on CoinMarketCap, is there an audit or no, or they don't even care, it's just an audit of a token or if it's an audit of the whole protocol. Uh, but they should have a, a source of information where they can like compare protocol to protocol to exact audit tests that being done. Yeah, maybe I, I feel like this panel is too positive. So maybe... <laughs> yeah, we're, we're getting there, we're getting there. Okay, so I think there's using something like Foundry for specification. I mean, we are talking about formal verification, but there's another thing which is equally interesting, which is formal specification. And formal specification has to be reusable. If you write speci your specification in solidity, it's usually, an, uh, it's usually not reusable. The beautiful thing about CVL, when we have quantifier, when we have high order function, when we have ghost, we write the specification once. So writing the specification is the hardest thing for us. If we move to Foundry, this is, we, we can use Foundry as a start, but the, when, the interesting thing, if you look into the solvency box that Satoa found after auditors, is actually because we wrote something like you have the sum of the values that maintain your asset. So we write some specifications which are reusable and it's very hard to write them in solidity. We don't want the specification to specify the bug. We want the specification, and yes, I know. I know where this is going. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you from the CBL point of view, of course, like, but I feel like that's what we were talking about before with you can write those beautiful specifications and require CBL and everything, um, but there's still a massive gap to what the developers can do themselves, right? And we need, I, I personally feel like we need to... I completely disagree, actually. Okay. The, if you ask to our developer, ask to code Barry, ask all the, they love it. This is what they want. They want specification which is close to the white paper. They don't want you to write in something which is... They want to, actually, it's the opposite. Ask them all, but some of them are still, here. But it's exactly still, the opposite. But those people are still at least semi-experts in FV. You will not get that kind of behavior from uh, the majority of Solidity developers. So you will be surprised. You will be surprised. Uh, companies like Trufa, you will be surprised how easy it is for people if you... Mass is not so bad. If you just have the closure of the mass, I actually, that's the thing that I was surprised. When I worked in formal methods, nobody wanted to write formal specification. And the things about DeFi, which is very, which was actually eye-opening for me, that people love formal specification. They don't like the fact that the tools don't work, but they like to write formal specification, right or wrong. Dun, dun, dun. Round one. <laughs> no. um, I, 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 I hear you. I think some things I agree with, some things I really don't. So reusability, I don't get it. We like you can still get reusability from partial specifications in Scribble, for example. There's no reason why we couldn't like recycle um, ERC20 specs. Or I, there's I actually can explain why you cannot, and because we have concrete examples. And actually, they actually you see that it's a career. Of actually, people run it. They let them write in Scribble. They let them write in CVL. And they complain that they cannot, and they have hundreds of examples that they saw it. Because what happened is that you write things which are too specific to the code and too specific to the bug. You describe the behavior of what caused the bug. The two things were equal. We are not trying to say the two things are equal. We are trying to say what property is. You are describing the bugs. That's what, that you can do after you found the audit. I, I agree that our partial specifications definitely require some similarities of the implementation. Whereas in CVL you can actually get generic enough that they are more easily reusable, but reusability is a spectrum. It's not like it's not or it is. Like, there, like it's you. There's I think things maybe, maybe, somewhere maybe, in the middle. Maybe I didn't explain why. It's the issue of describing the desired properties versus describing the bugs. In a language like Scribble, you describe the bugs that you found, which is useful. In a language like CVL, you describe the desired properties, which is also useful. And 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 then we have the SMT chokers trying to find the bugs, not us. 
The SMT checkers, and sometimes they succeed and sometimes they fail. And when they fail, they will do something else. But we are not trying to find the bugs, we are trying to find the desired properties. And that's a very, very different thing. We should, we yeah, 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 we're not going to press on this right now. We obviously disagree, but we are good friends. Yeah, I, I guess the, the question to me is, are you able to get to the developers soon enough before they've actually started to write most of the code, before they're going back, and then they're saying, okay, based on the code that I wrote, can I write the specification versus writing the specification first? Um, so what, what, what does the order end up being, and are they doing that themselves, or are they paying someone else to do it? Which to me is like the big question for tooling. It's like, okay, you've built a successful security tool when you're not paying other people to uh, use the tool for you. Um, which is why we've been very like, uh, let's say, um, as much as like the, I'm sure tooling conversations have come up in the past opens up, and that's why we never really wanted to wade into that. Both because like other people were already doing a very good job doing it, but we also just saw that as a challenge. We have reusable contracts, and that that alone is already enough to try to get people to use them safely. Um, because that to me is the problem when you have reusable like potential specifications. Is the the most valuable thing for a specification is forcing developer to explicitly understand what they're trying to do, and if they're reusing someone else's spec, they might not get that benefit. That's what I wanted to bring up next, like, who are you building the tools for? Um, for experts, for uh, everyday, for, for like, the normal solution developers, and it's also a question of, like, of the amount of education one needs to get before, and I'm not targeting specifically CDL versus writing specs and scribble or solidity, but of course there is a certain amount of hours that need to spend, and money, of course, you're not gonna, like, you're not gonna get people to teach you all these things for free, well, you might, but not always, so it's also, um, it's also a question of like, what is available right now that I can just go look it up and in five minutes write a property, which is what Everett was showing, that you can write those very basic properties in Foundry that, that give you some level of assurance, right? Not as high as KVM, um, as CBL store proof and everything, but you do it in five minutes, right? Versus other things that you might need one or two days to learn and even weeks to get proficient at, right? So, for people who build the tools, or like from the tools that you use, email or and, and Mike, what do you feel like? Um, who are you building the tools for, and um, who do you think the tools are being built for? Yeah, so we target two types of customers: the developers and the auditors, security researchers, and I think they are both doing great things. Actually, the thing that we see, and I think we see it from every talk that CVL is actually, at least at the beginning, it resembles like unit tests. And you see the customers that work with us, some of them, they actually write unit tests, and, and uh, maybe they don't get the same insurance, but they're, if they're happy, they're happy. They basically write specific properties, and you can do it in CVL. But we actually see that people write more and more interesting spec. We just finished a, a project with Ave, where basically the community wrote spec. And I think there were, I think, three people there that actually, they were, this was their first project, and they actually found a huge bug in the code with the spec, they were very happy. So we actually see that people say that formal verification is hard, and I think it's definitely the case, but formal specification, at least in the case of DeFi, it may not be so bad. There are some properties that you can specify, and being a DeFi expert, it's actually not so bad. And, and if you are a security researcher, it's very natural. For example, we see people at the Spearbeat and Code Arena, they are writing specifications which are in as interesting as we write. I, like, for us, this has always been a challenge. And like, we have ex Dilly members here. I see Alex and I see John, which is the other Diligence co-founder, now at Optimism, up there. And they know that this is true, and Daniel downstairs. They know that this is true, so we struggled with this for a really, really long time. Uh, we always thought that we were building the tools for the auditors, and that was not true. <laughs> we felt miserably at that. Like we kept asking, "Hey, but like, who? Like, we should service us first. And it ended up never being that way. The, the I think the product team had this whimsical desire, and and I love. And I, by the way, I'm not saying this with with bad blood. I I love our product team, but they had these whimsical desires of just like servicing this very niche thing. And so we ended up never building for the auditors. We ended up building for the people that were gonna use it, which by definition are the developers of the protocols, right? 
uh, well, like on the end tail of the of the rest of the tooling that we have that is not as sophisticated as say Mithril or or, or the Fuzzer Harvey and all of that, all of them are also dedicated dev, dev tooling. So like the VS Code extension that Martin from our team Martin Ardner builds, which is amazing by the way, and you should use it. Uh, it's also completely directed towards uh, towards developers and, and all of the smaller things that we've built over the years. So I think it's really hard to build for others from our perspective. If, uh, first, I wanted to I had uh, an idea in mind that uh, uh, most of the developers they are like massively learning from Open Zeppelin and uh, perhaps. Uh, uh, emphasizing more uh, the need of documentation of is uh, something that will ease the pain of all, all of us, especially for formal verification teams. And uh, yeah, uh, and second, like what, uh, like the two, like the key product that I wanted to speak, CR that life, uh, who are building it for? We are building it for to make uh, like a big pressure on uh, projects um, to like invest much more in their security. So Seattle Live first um, uh, was released in 2018 with specific focus on the uh, cryptocurrency exchange security where we were doing like our like overall over, uh, review of um, by like 15 parameters of every like 400 exchanges and then we uh, added information about penetration tests, bug bounties, uh, certain other things and we created the ranking that uh, afterwards was used by CoinGecko and CoinGecko trust score now is 20% from uh, uh, its security ranking and is taken from our data. And by doing that, CoinGecko put a massive pressure on the exchanges to start doing the pen test, to start uh, solving issues that they had, to start making bug bounties. And I think it was a result. Uh, the result is that right now we see much less centralized exchange hacks. And uh, the next uh, evolution stage of our product CR.life is to put again much more pressure on uh, smart contracts, on blockchain protocols, DeFi projects to start doing more than just, you know, like uh, an audit from a random company who is just doing some automatic scans. Yeah, I, I guess what I would add to that, because everyone already, I think, added a really good, uh, a deeper point, and I think from our perspective, it's. Um, are you building it for developers that care about security or developers that don't really understand the risks that they're getting into in the space? And I guess that's the first thing you have to do is you have to educate them on like, okay, what is the risk of deploying a DeFi project? It's, unless you are watching Wrecked and you're watching exactly what goes wrong, you might not necessarily, like, it's hard to quantify security risk um, of like what could go wrong um, until it does go wrong. And so I think trying to like, like basically what you described, like give a quantifiable value for like, okay, not doing this is giving you essentially this potential risk or this potential cost. Um, it, but then even then, like figuring out, okay, cost equals paying someone to to manage that risk, which is paying someone either your developer team or a special security team to do it, or an external security team to do it. Um, and then figuring out, okay, what's the use case? Like if I'm deploying a token that's really simple based on the library, maybe there isn't as high security cost there, but maybe for something like DeFi or very custom there is. So, that's usually my take when I talk to clients is like they want to know like why should I justify the cost for this um, in terms of the tooling um, and how is it going to be reusable, how is it going to be extendable, that sort of thing. Thanks. One thing I wanted to ask you specifically, Zima. So you, you guys at Hacken work with a lot more, um, like a bigger variety of chain to different projects, right? Because they feel like Sertora and Diligence and opens up on a very Ethereum focus. How do you feel like, um, what is the difference in tooling and, and, and process and this kind of things in Ethereum versus other um, yeah, so Yeah, the landscape of uh, other chains is much worse. Basically, you don't have any tools uh, like so, so good as uh, we have in Ethereum. And it's all it's in Solana, Rust, uh, uh, even the Polkadot. Um, uh, the, you, the scope of the audit is usually all about the line-by-line -line analytics. Yeah, one by line review. Unfortunately, there are some fast testing tools, but they they don't cover even the static uh, analyzers. So we're actually working on a on a Solana version, which is coming soon. Amazing! We would love to use it. Yeah, basically the the ideas we do like many mathematicians. We we have our own language and we compile from EBPF to to the tab to our language. 
Our tool actually doesn't work on the EVM, it works on a lower level language, which is called TAP. And we basically compi compile everything to TAP, and then from the TAP, we do everything in the analysis. I just can say a big thank you, because <laughs> like, we are not ready to, to build the tools, but they are needed for sure. I just want to confirm with the organizers how uh, 5, 10, how long do we have? How much time do we have? Five minutes, I think. I think we're still Are we done? Two hours. Twenty more minutes? Uh, yeah, I had like one or two more questions, then we can just like wrap it up. Yeah, actually, uh, does anyone have questions? Um, polemic questions and courage. Like, do we have um, extra mics? I can also come over. I feel it's well, going to be a bloody yes. question. Okay, thank you. Who needs a mic? Okay, coming, Matt. Please don't make us fight. <laughs> I actually failed at that, so... <laughs> no, well... Uh. We got a little bit. <laughs> okay, I got a question here. Um, I'm not an auditor, I'm from the builder side. So, we use a lot of tools. You said a lot of tools are open source, it's made it available for first for auditors and then for the builders. All those efforts are really good, but let's put all those to be as aside and let's get to the crux, right? If a builder wants to use uh, the, the tools to build the formal specifications, right? The pain they have to go through it. It's not easy as it works. So for example, like, you know, most of the the, the tooling that he used for um, currently for, for smart contracts, it just based on what has happened before. So the first question that you get is like, how much of your code has been forked? And the answer is zero trouble. And oh, is there any other competitor that you have? No, this, we're trying to approach new because the DeFi is completely transfer in a transforming from on a day-by-day -day basis, even if you build a sub, you know, very base level protocol, the second order effect who is building on top of it can actually produce a lot of bugs. Um, it takes about five to six months to get a, you know, run all the fuzzing, you know, all the kind of tools and everything is okay, okay. From there to point to start writing CDL based or the property specifications and you find real good bugs from there. You have issues, but this is not possible for a developer team to go and say, hey, I'm going to attempt a formal verification. Most of the formal verification says that I'm going to get a badge. You know, I use this tool. So if you want to make it work, like rather than saying, take an ivory tower approach, you have to get to the developer team, like maybe like a bounty, you know, kind of stuff, like more formal verification kind of capsule size things. People can get, you know, some kind of bounty, like, that, that was very really useful for the smart contracts to find the bugs. You mean the tool creators? Yeah, not the tool creator, but get it open to for more builder um, community. What are the things that you're doing today to, to, to start that conversation, like actual builders? Like if they, want to, if they want to write a formal specification and do some kind of formal verification, I think. Okay, so this is going to the conversation that Moldy was having before, so Moldy will fight you on this, obviously. <laughs> We've seen it. But, um, but like, thinking about it, like, what we do with Scribble, and I totally agree with you. It's, it's hard. It's fucking hard. Like, nobody wants to write it because, like, nobody wants to learn it. Learning is hard. Like, you want to do whatever you already know, and you want to put that in practice. Writing Scribble is not easy. And it's probably easier than a bunch of other stuff, right? And what we do is that we actually have managed services. For, for Scribble, like we actually have to write specifications for people. What we do to help educate is we do workshops at, 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 at all of the conferences throughout the year. Do you know how many people go to those? Two per conference. <laughs> like it's literally we prepare these like 90 minute workshop and like two people show up. One of them doesn't have a laptop. <laughs> and it's just like, and so there the answer lies and he said like how many people actually comes to your workshops? Right? It's the problem with the people that who don't want to do it. Everyone wants to write it. Right? We spent about six months to do this. 
the cost and effort is huge, but we're satisfied how to do this in the, the, the result that's producing. Everyone wants to come and to learn it, but how much that the approach from the, the creator, the tool creators, are taking to, to reach out to them, no. to, to the, the, the teachings. Yeah, so I think I agree with you totally, actually, and uh, maybe I should be very careful in my answer, but if you pay people, they do some things. Uh, <laughs> so, so, yes, uh, we, for example, we work with Sakura, we had, we had this uh, test, I guess we picked the best 16, and out of them, uh, three our employees, that's fantastic, yeah. If you pay people, they do some stuff. I'm sure OpenZeppelin probably does it too. Actually, they even promote our specification. That's great. So yeah, I, I agree. I think maybe we don't disagree in the sense that you need to provide incentive for people to do something. Code Arena has a one nice incentive. Now they they do spend, they do audit, they do now they do rules. You, creating incentive. So we also have workshop when we have two people. It's a, <laughs> we share that, don't worry. But the issue, the interesting thing that you find, you have two people, you have 20 that actually take it online, and out of them, ab about 20 actually come up with specifications which are very interesting. And specifically, actually, if you look at the auditing, I'm not an auditor, but I believe that auditing is a very hard work. And, 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 and if you get people, if you write specification with a tool, it actually can make the auditing more fun. Yeah, realistically, I'm going to hop into this one real quick to say um, I think the, the best way to think about tooling, both post deployment and pre deployment. So, like, we're not focused on just much pre deployment tooling with Open Zeppelin outside of specific things like upgrade plugins and stuff like that, but we have been doing monitoring and trying to get people to write monitoring along with the smart contracts they deploy. And so, it, it's very similar to, I imagine, the pain that a lot of people went through when DevOps became a thing, which is like, okay, do I really want to invest in like automating my deployment and then I have to fix my deployment tooling? And it's a long, gradual process, but eventually you see massive dividends. Um, so really we're seeing like DevSecOps, which is security DevOps, basically like investing in developer operations where security is just like built into the platform and you're gonna have to put a lot of investment in that. And you should start small. You don't have to like formally verify on day one, but you should like start finding what the steps are to get there. And for us at Open Zeppelin, like trying to get Forda as a post-deployment tool that projects work on, one was like doing a lot of community outreach, uh, doing Gitcoin grants, uh, building a lot of like demos based on both our templates and other things that would get people to build. And, and like, oh, I'll try this out. Oh, it seems to work. And then try to eventually get to the point where they see that like early value, just a kernel of it, enough where they're like, okay, maybe I'll keep reinvesting. Um, now this is us in post deployment, but I imagine that that is going to be a similar process that you find in, in the pre deployment world, which is like you just gotta if you can catch like one or two like serious bugs that you didn't have to pay your auditors to catch, then hopefully you're you're going to see more and and you eventually reach like the promised land, which is everything's formally verified and um, you know you you can basically be in a like the same level of security that you might have for, uh, what do you call it, like like airline uh, like parts that are going out into production. Like that's that seems to be the goal that we all talk about, but you know it'll take a while. Yeah, I wanted to add that uh, like uh, money drives everything. So imagine uh, I don't know like uh, us all of us going to study I don't know some uh, astrology thing which is uh, dependency of some stars just because uh, we're interested in it. No. If someone will say that this is the most highest paid job in the world to study, and then we're all going to be there. So I think that uh, starting the tools like is driven definitely by us. For example, that we are pushing our um, new hires, the people that we uh, educate, that they need to go and study all the tools available. Also, it will, it is slowly, but it is uh, being pushed by newly bug bounty platforms that they like promote that starting the tools you will be able to make some money but yeah other than that uh, people of course they are not they are lazy to learn if they don't see the immediate uh, financial benefits um, we can do one more round to conclude the, ses the session oh sorry oh, no if you want to have a question Hi, so I just have a question for Moonly. So you mentioned before that you had this community pro uh, process with Ave to write specifications, but from the community. Can you tell us a bit how you motivated the community and how, you know, because it's not that easy as we discussed, so I'd love to hear more practically how it worked. 
Yeah, so the idea is that we basically, every time, so the Aave, I guess like many other protocol, they basically uh, write code and then they go through the audit. So basically every time they, they wrote code, we basically started the specification, so we wrote basically the basic specification, and we and people submit their own rules. Uh, I should say not all the rules were good, but some of the rules, and, and actually the problem for us is reviewing the rules. People have more bugs sometimes in the rules than in the code, but then the good rules actually found bugs, and if you have a good rule, it was incentivized of uh, money, basically you get between uh, 1,000 to 5,000, I probably not saying the numbers completely right, and the, it was decided by a community which is uh, Ave and Sator, basically how much you get, depending on the rules that you have. And the rules which are actually adapted, some of them they are now checked in the CI, so basically every time they change the code, they will check that these rules are maintained, which is fantastic. That's the best rule we want to have. These are reusable rules, every time you change the code, and it was one-time contribution, but we are also thinking of mechanism where if somebody writes a rule and then Sartora sells as an SAS service, then you need to incentivize them because part of this technology, our technology is useless without the rules. So basically, if you write the rules, you get incentivized. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to do one more round of the session. I'm uh, basically asking you, um, about if you have anything you're excited about for DevCon, any sessions that you recommend people to watch. Um, I'll start. Um, I'm giving a talk about building um, a full end-to-end -end EVM symbolic execution engine in Solidity, fully written Solidity, including the solver, um, mostly for fun. Wow. Um, so that's gonna be Friday, 11 a.m., I think. Um, Harry, who's sitting over there, is giving a similar talk on Thursday, 4 p.m. 3 p.m. Uh, what is Harry's talk? About... <laughs> symbolic computation for fun and profit, and he used the same solver that I use in my talk as well, so it's a good um, link. Um, yeah. So, um, I, I'm doing another panel like this at DEF CON, I think it's Thursday, 2 p.m. Um, hopefully the same amount of blood, so if you want to be entertained you can show up. Uh, and I'm excited for Arepas and beer and cumbia. So actually it's funny, the, fortunately, the next person, I'm not going to be here. <laughs> You're going to be with Chandra, and Chandra is, it will be interesting. So yeah, I'm actually not on a panel. I think it's uh, about time for me to, we have fantastic people on the team, and uh, Chandra and Andy, she will be there. We have also Uwe Kirsten, who is fantastic. Uh, he's also not yet here, but he's going to talk about using our tool, and I, I think I already mentioned that formal verification is actually, it could be dangerous in some sense. And some level of paranoia is always, and I think Everett also mentioned it, some level of paranoia is always good when you are using formal verification. We are already have one customer that uses us in addition to top auditors, and then he trusted us because he wrote the spec, and he actually, is, he actually wrote beautiful specs. And the problem with these specs, they were what we call vacuous. So vacuous spec is a spec that I actually hold independent of the code. And then somebody using uh, bug bounty found a bug, and then he was basically accused us, because he said, look, I verified that. And in fact, there was no failure of the tool, there was a failure in the specification. So this is actually something that we will talk about. Uh, maybe I can just uh, have one announcement. We are also organizing just a fun event, which is a running event tomorrow in the park. It's a, you can also come walk, it's a gravel, it's only three kilometers, so please come and enjoy if you want. Uh, with all the uncertainty happening in, our, uh, in my country, we missed the deadlines uh, to, for the speaking slots. Uh, but we will have uh, breakfast uh, on Wednesday uh, together with uh, Ethereum Enterprise Alliance. Um, it's going to be at uh, Web3 Retreat. Uh, um, uh, I'm not sure. At the higher. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to be there. I'll be there, by the way. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so. Um, Which yeah. way? Grand Hyatt or, or the, the one at Agora? Uh, the one where they had registration for DEF CON. Okay. Um, it's close to the main venue. 
Yeah, so we will just speak about what is Ethereum Enterprise Alliance, what are the working groups there, what are they working on. Um, I'm personally involved with the group called Drama. Uh, it's all about the uh, big picture risks of the blockchain projects. So we're trying to make the risk inventory that is not only related to smart contract vulnerabilities, but also for broadly. Um, this whole thing is all about uh, building understandable framework for Tradify. We believe that this is the next uh, big boom and this is our area of work in EEA. So everybody is welcome on the breakfast uh, on Wednesday. All right, yeah, and for my part, uh, there's going to be some fun opens up on talks at DEF CON, so I guess I'll hype up uh, Hadrian that's going to be speaking on October 12th. Uh, for those who don't know, he's like one of the main smart contract auditor auditors of the library, so, I'm sorry, not auditors, developers. Um, but if you have any uh, comments or complaints, he's the person to talk to, but he'll talk a little bit about smart contract patterns and fun stuff. And then tomorrow, uh, our very own Marto, who's basically like soloing our uh, like Cairo like ecosystem development in uh, start that. He's going to talk about account abstraction, which I think is really cool. Uh, who's hyped for account abstraction, by the way? Woo! Yes, okay, thank you. Um, and then, uh, like, I will also be uh, hanging out at the EEA. And I, I work on a separate working group uh, called ETH Trust, uh, which is trying to kind of specify, like, what are good standards for audits. Um, it's still very beginning phases. Uh, it's, it's Gonzalo's favorite certification authority. Uh, <laughs> you're on those certifications, too late. Um, I know. But um, yeah, if anyone's interested in just talking more about like how we're trying to figure things out, uh, feel free to come in. It's you know enterprise alliance, which means it's slightly more boring than normal Ethereum events. But that's good because if it's boring, that means the security is working. Cool. Thank you all uh, very much for the panel. Let's thank thank the thank you, Liz.